Good Thursday evening to you, everybody. Thanks for joining us for tonight's Town Hall Forum. Your voice, your future, your vote. The midterm elections 2022. There is a lot that we're going to cover over the next hour or so. We brought in a very distinguished panel of guests. Uh, we like to think they're pretty distinguished. We, <laughs> the, there's a lot of races to talk about here in the state of South Carolina. Here to my left, we have uh, former Mark Sanford staffer and longtime political strategist Joel Sawyer, also the uh, chairman of the state Democratic Party, Trav Robertson, longtime friends of Watch Fox and uh, longtime contributors to all of our programming here. Uh, we're getting down to the to brass tacks, as yes. they say. Right. We're a little less than uh, two weeks away mm -hmm. now, November the 8th. But of course, voting starts here next week right. for early voting. But there's a lot to talk about from South Carolina all the way up to Washington. There's so much riding on these midterm elections. These are the type that, that bring people to the polls, the mm -hmm. governor's races, the midterms where if people aren't happy with what's going on in Washington, they show up and they show people uh, that they're not happy, or they are for, for that matter. But let's start here at home first. Let's start with the big ticket item, the governor's race. Um, I've covered a lot of governor's races over the years. <laughs> and for some reason, I don't feel the juice in this one. I, I really don't, but the incumbent Governor Henry McMaster and of course the challenge from uh, the former Congressman Joe Cunningham. Um, where do we begin with this race? I'll, I'll allow you to, to lead off seeing it. He, he's, oh, really? he's, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to allow you to lead off, Trav, with this one because the Democratic Party is the visiting team here, so to speak, because okay. they're challenging <laughs> and they always get to lead off. <laughs> well, I, I think that it is an interesting race and I think it is an interesting electorate it's an interesting election cycle coming out of COVID. Um, you know, 2020 was, was different. Um, but the truth is, is that Henry McMaster's got a very long record on which to run. Uh, South Carolina, according to U.S. News and World Report, ranks at the bottom. Uh, you know, we have one of the highest, if not the highest crime rates in America. We're 31st at fiscal stability, 34th and 36th as it relates to access to health care. Um, but but both of these campaigns have done something different in, in the sense that the, the ground troops are not where they normally are, and they're taking it to the digital airways, mm -hmm. which is your forte, as well as television. And I think it's extremely interesting, but, but this has really come down to two issues. One is, is that Joe Cunningham and Tally represent a new generation of South Carolinians as opposed to Henry, who's been in office or some form of government longer than I've been alive. And the simple truth is that for the first time, we're actually seeing a government attempting to take away perceived rights from women. And that's going to be in, in, in the special session we saw this week and the week before the week before that, dealing with uh, women's freedom is going to be on the ballot. And it's going to be very interesting to see. I mean, look, every every year the Democrats in this state think that, you know, say that this year is going to be different. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, a child at Christmas who thinks that this year is going to be the year that Santa's <laughs> finally going to bring him that pony. Um, but look, the, the electorate in the South. Horse, oh, okay. Well, yeah. But, I mean, by the time you finally get it, it's going to be, it's going to be a horse. <laughs> it's going to be a full grown uh, horse. It's going to be full grown. But look, I mean, the, the electorate in South Carolina is, is just not demographically ready to elect a, a Democrat statewide quite yet. I mean, look, we saw in 2020 where uh, Jamie Harrison had over a hundred million dollars spent was an incredible candidate was an inc yeah. ran an incredible campaign um, and you know had Democratic uh, headwinds nationally behind him and, and still basically finished you know generic ballot um, Joe Cunningham is, is nowhere near the candidate that Jamie Harrison was, and it, it is going to be a, a bad night for Democrats on election night. It always is. Uh, it, it always has been historically when that incumbent president is in office. You know, the, the incumbent president's party generally has a bad night on, on election night. So, but so. I also think that you're, you're comparing apples to oranges here is that Jamie Harrison's campaign was extremely nationalized. This election cycle is not. And mm -hmm. I think Joe Cunningham has done a very good job at focusing on issues that relate to South Carolina and comparing and contrast the fact that he's extremely young, Henry McMaster is not so young, and the fact is, is that Henry McMaster and modern day Republicans have one interest and that is taking away the rights and freedom from women. 
You're talking about expanding abortion beyond six weeks. I'm talking about taking away the freedom and, and criminalizing. And, see, and, this, is, and this is where and this is where uh, Democrats always overplay their hand because there is broad support for abortion up to a certain up to viability and, and, and that is a bet um, that the Republicans have made. But think about no, that, this. That's but, but, that's, but, that's but, data. but let's but, look but at Democrats this. Democrats never want to say women, up until viability. They want women, to say they want to keep women it much have more broad. only think about this. Women were only given the right to vote in the 1920s. They were not allowed to have credit cards and bank accounts until 1971. And the Supreme Court, the institution that is responsible for protecting rights from overreach in Congress and overzealous police agencies in this land, has taken away a fundamental right which every Supreme Court justice for the last 50 years has said is codified or established law. And yet the first thing that Henry McMaster does and the Republicans that control everything is make a move to take away the rights of women and criminalize the behavior. Think about this. That right now, your Republicans have introduced or are introducing a bill that will prevent every single state employee, 500,000 state employees, from accessing or having their health care plan cover birth control for their children. Yeah, and, and I, look, I, I think this is a great attempt of, of not me nationalizing the race, but Trav nationalizing the race. Well, that's as, a as South well. Carolina law. It is a that's, South that's, Carolina I mean, law, but, but you're trying to grab onto the to the oh, headwinds okay. from the Supreme Court. Whereas, and if you want to talk about nationalizing the race, if you talk about inflation, if you talk about gas prices, you talk about grocery prices, those are things that people are feeling in their real life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and that, you know, I think the Democrats nationally are going to have a very hard time explaining why they're the answer when they're con in control of the House, the Congress, and the White House, yet people are still facing these very real-life pressures on their wallets and pocketbooks so, every day. So Republicans control nine constitutional offices, six of seven congressional seats, a supermajority in the state legislature, and a majority in the House, but it's all Democrats' fault. No, I'm saying you can't have it both ways. I'm I saying, you can't, it I'm both saying ways. you can't defend Joe Biden on one hand for, you know, these, these forces that are largely beyond his control and then blame all those same things on Henry McMaster. Well, I wasn't doing that. I was saying that Joe Cunningham has done a very good job at making sure this race was about South Carolina issues. What I talked about was what Henry McMaster and the Republicans in the Senate and the House have done. I didn't talk about what Lindsey Graham was doing in the United States Senate. And I do believe that Jamie Harrison's campaign during the middle of COVID changed the way Democrats campaign mm -hmm. because we didn't want our employees to get sick. We didn't want voters to get sick. Coupled with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, which motivated a group of white, older evangelical voters that were not going to vote for a man that cheated on his wife with a porn star. They weren't going to vote for us. But then Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death motivated those people. That's why Pence came to Greenville. Coupled with the fact that Donald Trump and the Republicans attacked the United States Post Office at a time in which more people were going to have to rely on voting by mail. Mm -hmm. And then the Democrats failed once again. We allowed the Republicans to control the narrative in defunding the police. So there are two different election cycles, and to say that they are the same is completely disingenuous. I don't think I don't think that the election cycles are necessarily the same. I, I don't think that the electorate in South Carolina has changed substantially between now and two years well, ago well, but, for a Democrat to win statewide. But I just, and, and indicated, there's just not the but I just indicated four issues that had a negative impact on the 2020 cycle. The fact is, is that 55.5% of the registered voters in this state are women. And in the past two election cycles... And a lot of those women are pro-life. Well, a the, lot of those but, women are pro-life But in the, as well. the past two election cycles, you've had in between 200 and 300,000 more women that vote. Coupled with the fact that 30% of the registered voters in the state are African Americans. So if, if you think about it and you have the normal drop off that happens in a non federal election cycle, it completely changes the It doesn't the because, because you're assuming that there's no drop off between the two groups that you need. And that's well, like historically I, never happened. That there's, there are so many ifs that go into a Democrat winning statewide in South Carolina that the possibility of it is just, is just been, negligible. It's been 20 years since they've held the governor's office. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what party you're in, you, you've hinted at the pocketbook issues here. Sure. Uh, the abortion issue is currently tied up in the courts. It, it, it's, it's tied up in a number of proposals at the state house right now. We don't even know what the future of it is here in South Carolina. But Regardless of that, people are paying more for everything. Mm -hmm. Regardless if you're a Democrat right. or a Republican, when you go to the pump, 
you're paying a lot for gas. Right. When you go get a loaf of bread, you're paying more for a loaf of bread for gas, for, for milk. What's the solution here? What, I mean, there, there's so many things going on here. Are the candidates adequately addressing that? In your I, opinion? I'll say something that Trav is actually going to like is, is uh -oh. that <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that. No, I mean, it, it, look, I mean, it, it, inflationary pressures and economic pressures are, are something that realistically governors, presidents, in, in Congress get way too much blame and or credit for is they, right. is they take blame you know they take credit when things are good they don't take, take blame, blame when, when it's bad right Skirt and, responsibility and, and, yeah. and yeah. look the, the reality is is that is that what's happening in our economy right now uh, is going to still be happening regardless of what po policies are coming out of Washington or coming out of Columbia South Carolina I mean and let's let's think about this from a rational perspective one is is that right now you've got three global actors you've got China you've got Russia, and right now you've got Iran, and then you've got OPEC. And the simple truth is, is that all of the presidents over the last 40 years have tried to manipulate and maneuver OPEC, and they still haven't gotten it right. Mm -hmm. and, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine has put a pressure on the global access to oil that is forcing the high prices. But I would like to point out that according to statistics, gas, the price of gas has dropped 50 cents to a dollar over the last year. And that's something that Biden, when he, when he tapped the strategic oil reserves of 100 million barrels several months ago and, done, and, and did another 15. Now, we don't necessarily like that, but it's akin to the General Reserve Fund ballot initiative and the Capital Reserve Fund. That's what they're there for. But I do believe that the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed is aimed specifically at a group of people, our senior citizens who live on a fixed income, that are targeted by this. It is the first time in the history of the program since 1964 that Medicare can now negotiate for lower drug prices. The second is, is that now senior citizens, they will be capped at $2,000 out-of-pocket expenses. And third, and probably the most damning for Republicans, is the fact that it works to actually lower the cost of insulin to $35. And all of the Republicans in South Carolina's congressional delegation voted against that. But yeah, I mean, look, because if you put 50 things in a bill, then you put, and, and like 47 of them are horrible, you pick out the three that you like and blame Republicans for voting against. That's the oldest political trick in the book. No, but you don't. <laughs> it goes to the heart of, of what you just tried to do to me a moment ago. You don't get to go after Biden and say he's not doing anything to combat inflation if you don't like the bill. The you don't, fact you is, don't is like 47 things in the bill. I mean, I guarantee you. Okay, if, if, well, if, let's, if, if, no, like, well, let's look, go to I mean, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. This bill. It Think was about barely it. bipartisan. Think, it's bipartisan but, in name only. Like if this. you put insulin, if you had a standalone bill for insulin, it would pass overwhelmingly. Let's talk about the infrastructure bill. Every single person listening to this program tonight or who will stream it wants one thing. They want water. They want clean water to brush their teeth, to bathe their children. That infrastructure bill is going to bring a billion dollars into this state to replace the lead pipes that bring all of water into our homes and to make sure that every community has access to clean drinking water. Now, I don't care if there are a million things in that bill. I think that is fundamentally important and a necessity to the people in our lives. And Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott and the Republicans in Congress voted against it. Think about this. You do stories time and time again about the flooding in Charleston. And the fact is, is we've got 800 bridges that are dangerous for people to drive over and buses to drive over. That infrastructure bill is going to bring the money into this state to fix those bridges. All of the construction you see, all of that is done because of Joe Biden and the Democrats who pass in the South Carolina Senate who pass the, the penny gas tax and the Republicans who voted against it. The Republicans are voting against things to make the lives of people in this state. If, if you're not for any of this, tell us what you're for. You want to take away the rights of women. You want to vote against clean drinking water into people's homes. You want to vote against African Americans having the right to vote. I mean, these are just things to make our lives better. Joel, I'll give you the last. Uh, portion of this segment, seeing he let off the segment. Yeah, no, get, no, no, that's fine. I mean, and, and look, I mean, it's, it's the oldest political trick in the book to, to <laughs> you know, to pass it, you know, to have a giant bill with 
three or four good talking points in it that's really just like a political grab bag for you know special favors back home. Um, I, I think that you know the, the Democrats out of D.C. are not doing a particularly good job at addressing pocketbook issues, and people see it keep getting worse and worse and worse. And so while a lot of things about uh, you know about abortion access or about Ukraine or about these things are, are are things that are important that people care about, they don't care about it every day in the same way that they care about going to the grocery store and what they're paying at the pop. All right, good first segment, gentlemen. We covered a lot of ground and a lot more to come. You're not going anywhere. You I'm two not, are sticking I'm around. Not, I thought we were you're done. staying. You're staying. <laughs> we're going to invite Jim Felder uh, to join our conversation next because the way that people vote is changing too. Right. Uh, it, it changed during the primary and it's going to be changing going forward uh, as well with this next vote. So when we come back, we're going to look at some of the ways that's changing and if it will change even more in the future. We'll be right back. <music> Right, welcome back, everyone, to this town hall. Your voice, your future, your vote. Hopefully, everyone got a chance to catch their breath during the break, <laughs> particularly these two guys, Joel Sawyer and Trav Robertson. But we have added just a, a, a wonderful voice to our conversation now. Mr. Jim Felder from the uh, Voter Education Project has served in a, a number of capacities over the years. We felt it was important to bring you in to this conversation because things have changed for how we cast our ballots, something that a lot of people have talked about on both sides of the aisle. Yes. The, the uh, opportunity to vote early, ahead of Election Day. No questions asked, no excuses, and I, I think a lot of people still have some confusion over that. What do we need to clear up for, for folks that maybe don't want to wait until <laughs> November? <laughs> well, it is a welcome and pleasing uh, fact that the legislature would open it up with just early voting period you know we went through this thing about voting in person absentee but yet you voted early but you couldn't say it was early voting you had to say absentee voting mm -hmm. well that's gone now however they did cut down the time limit it's to two weeks now well that's fine but they have also established more polling places to do it this time around for example Richmond County there are five places that you can go to vote early starting this Monday running through November 4th. So that's a welcome opportunity there. In Lexington County, same situation. There are five places open where you can go from 8.30 in the morning until 6.30 in the evening to cast your ballot. So that solves a lot of problems with people who, in the past who didn't want to do this absentee thing or who had to lie about where, where they were going or couldn't do it or what have you. All that's gone now. So it's open season, early voting. Now, the other thing is, who is running? And that's where my phone is beginning to blow up now. Well, who, who are these candidates? I haven't seen so-and-so out there. Look at this. Uh, so now I'm directing them to SouthCarolinaVotes.org. Right. Get your sample ballot. All yeah. you have to do is do five things, put in your last name, first name, uh, four digits, Social Security, and date of birth, and click, and your ballot will come out. Not Trav's ballot, my ballot, your people ballot. I can vote for in my, my community. So that's going to help a lot. So we're directing people that way. Um, we don't have the problems that other states had in terms of uh, people who had criminal records being able to vote. You know, South Carolina is one of, I think, only three states in the nation that once you register to vote, you permanently registered. The only reason that you would come off the registration rolls if a criminal act occurs and then, of course, the clerk of court send your name in and they take you off. But once you've served your time, paid your fine, you're not on parole, or you're not on probation, you can go back and register again as a full citizen. You heard what's going on in Florida. Right. Mm -hmm. You heard what's going on down there now. Locking up people because they re-registered to vote, didn't know it was a problem because the registration people accepted their information. Yeah. So now, Governor Santanas, is that his name? I don't know. I can't remember his name. DeSantis. He knows his name. Yeah, DeSantis. He's got a posse out there now arresting people who did not know that they committed an error by right. registering again. Yeah. We don't have that problem in South Carolina. So we're headed in the right, right direction, but we need to do more about turnout. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. Like you said, a lot of people asking questions, who's who? Who mm -hmm. am I voting for? Yeah. We, we found at least some ways to, to clear that up. Now, th this whole topic <laughs> of, of, of early voting has been a sticking point mm -hmm. yeah. in state legislatures, even at the national level. 
and, and is used almost as a tool <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to, to, to divide people. Yeah. Um, are we moving in the right direction? D does more need to be done to give access to the vote? Well, yes, <laughs> we need to do promote it more, uh, not just leave it to the campaigns to do the advertising in the individual communities. There needs to be more local participation in the political process. Uh, I spent early three days in Charleston last week. The only issue we've had thus far, this election cycle, was the congressional districts. Uh, it ended up, McMaster signed a bill that created a six congressional district that runs from Ch Columbia all the way to Charleston, and that's Jim Clyburn's district now. We thought it was unfair, so NAACP sued. I testified last week. We can do better than that. We don't need to pack all of the black folk in one district, right. and that's what's happening now. Give us some influence in other districts. So that was why we challenged the court. The case was heard in Charleston. Uh, Judge Gergel was the only three-judge panel. Uh, we testify. We won't know what happened until December. But that was the only issue this year that concerned me and a lot of folk in the African-American community was the redistricting. Otherwise, turnout is a problem on both sides. When you've got 3.3 million registered voters in South Carolina, of that number, roughly 100,000 African Americans, and you're only turning out 55, 56 percent, what happened to the rest of them? Somebody is not doing their job. So we are calling on ministers, and particularly because they've got a, an audience every Sunday morning, to do more about educating people to vote. Not telling them who to vote for, whether voting for a Republican or a Democrat, but educating them the urgency that I we need to get out of vote. I prefer the Democrat. I just <laughs> <laughs> but, I do, but I do think, I do think to the heart of what you're saying, it, you know, I, I went to the, the bill signing and I took a lot of flack for it. And But part of the thing is this, is that when you see other southern states who are denying access to the, the voter, the ballot box, is it's unheard of to have two weeks of unencumbered early vote. And to your point is that it doesn't do any good if we're not taking advantage of it. But I also think that it was critical because that's one of the things that the Rules and Bylaws Committee of the Democratic National Committee will look at when determining uh, what place South Carolina is in nominating our Democratic nominee for president. But uh, I think there, the concern we saw in that piece of legislation is now and we first saw it in the mayor's race in Columbia, is that the State Election Commission now has unfettered ability to take over any county election board that they so choose. And, you know, when the mayor's race was occurring at 3 o'clock, one opponent stood up and said, had a press conference, something was happening, and, and the press reported on it, and then the executive director of the State Election Commission said, by goodness, we're going to have an audit which inferred that something had occurred when in reality nothing had occurred. And so that's what people are going to have to be mindful of is that, you know, do we have new staff coming in to run these polling precincts because some of our more learned citizens as a result of COVID are not necessarily willing to do that. And so, you know, you need to make sure you know they're all. Go to scvotes.org. Uh -huh. They've got a great website that helps you. or uh, And it will tell you where those early early locations are to vote. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably one of the only issues we'll talk about <laughs> this evening. <laughs> well, there isn't going to be much debate. There no, isn't going to yeah. be much argument. No, no, no. Uh, you would have to be on the same page with everybody. I, I absolutely. I mean, look, I think the more people that vote, the better. Um, and, and I think we ought to make it as easy as possible for as many people as possible to vote. I, I think if your political strategy um, you know, boils down to uh, diminishing or hurting voter participation in some way, you've got a problem with your ideas as a party. Um, I, I would further, I know we're talking about November, but, but I, you know, I would further say that it's incredibly important that more and more people uh, vote in the primary process. Right. And this is something I harp on all the right. time. We end up on the, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic right. side with terrible candidates heading into the general election yeah. That's right. because people do not participate in the primary process. And we have to make sure that these candidates running in the primary process know that voter participation is going to be up, know that there are more voters watching what they say and what they're advocating so that we don't nominate such extreme people on either side. Yeah. Well, one thing I did also want to include in this segment, there's still talk of 
you know, bullying at the polls, voter intimidation at the polls. We even had a news conference at the State House today with some yep. civic groups m making claims of that, not necessarily in where we're sitting in Richland County or Columbia, but making some claims about things that have happened in Florence County and mm -hmm. some, some other outlying mm -hmm. counties. What is it that a voter should do if they encounter something like that? First of all, we hope it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but how does it, how, what is the right way to handle a situation like that? You, you've dealt with voters for so long, Mr. Felder. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you invite people to do if they see something they feel just as out of place? Report it to the poll manager and do it quickly. Uh, um, you're gonna have more law enforcement involved, I think, in the election this time around. I think there's gonna be one at almost every uh, polling place or at major polling places. But report it immediately to the, to the po poll manager. And then the poll manager's responsibility is then to bring in law enforcement uh, if there is a problem there. Uh, now the policeman's not going to be inside. Right. Can't be out, but it's going to be outside, out of distance. But the poll manager know he or she is there, and they immediately call in to quell anything that seems like it's going to cause an uprising. Mm -hmm. you, you can call our office, 803-799-7798, uh, ask for Helen Strain. We'll have a team of lawyers standing by. And I think it's a very significant issue, and I think the legislature needs to act immediately in a bipartisan fashion and, and say that if you harass an election day worker, uh, you could go to jail for 10 or 15 years, uh, $100,000, $200,000 in fines. I mean, think about this. In the last several weeks, we have had four, if not five, county election commission executive directors resign yeah because they are yeah. being threatened by these yeah. so-called patriotic election integrity people who don't know what in the hell is going on or how to make an election work. And they are harassing civil servants and they're forcing them in. All of them happen to be women of color. Yeah. And I think that there's a clear pattern and I don't care if you're a Republican or not. I've lost my fair share of elections and I've never questioned whether or not someone did untoward to us. And I've won my fair share of elections and we've won them fair and square. And those people who are doing this, they ought to be locked up and they ought to be thrown away. You know, we have enhanced penalties for threatening teachers, right. yeah. for That's threatening right. law enforcement officers. There's no reason in the world that couldn't be applied. Exactly that couldn't right. or should be applied to election And if Henry well. McMaster knew what was going on in this state, he'd stand up tomorrow and have a press conference and say, these people will be thrown under the jail. Very, very, very important issue, and in, in, in this day and age, shouldn't happen. Never should have happened. That's right. But That's right. It certainly shouldn't today. And to, to Mr. Felder's point, there will be a presence there, yeah. from what it sounds like, of of law enforcement and some level of security to make sure that people are doing things by the book and not intimidating anyone. Right. We're going to invite you back for the final segment, but we're going to shift our attention here after the break. We're going to talk about education a little bit. That's a, that's key. Oh, good. Every election cycle, we're going to. Uh, Sherry East is with us from South Carolina Education sure. Association. A lot of things to talk about in sure. that sector, and we cannot talk about elections if we don't hit something that impacts all of us, right. whether we have a child or not. That's exactly. right. Folks, come back and join us after the break. Welcome back. We're talking about the midterm elections, your voice, your future, your vote. The midterm election 2022 election day, of course, is just a couple of weeks away. Early voting, though, as we just learned, starts the 24th, and everyone can take part in that. No doubt about that. We, we, we calmed ourselves down in segment two. <laughs> But we do have a key issue to talk about. We have to talk about education. In every election cycle, it is so important whether we're, uh, forget the election cycle, it's just important overall. And that's why we invited Sherry East onto the program from the South Carolina Education Association. You're such a valuable voice when it comes to this. We, we have made some progress, I think, with some things that they have done in the legislature to address some issues. But still, we have an overwhelming teacher shortage right now. What do people need to know before they cast a ballot about what is going on and what you need to see happen in classrooms? Well, we do have a, a giant teacher shortage. And for the first time in years, we've seen teachers walk out mid-year, um, which usually doesn't happen. They're gonna wait till the end of the year, but we have seen thousands of teachers leave mid-year. They're just done, they're done. And so there are lots of vacancies right now in our school systems and in front of your children. So education's on the ballot, definitely. And the state superintendent race is on the ballot this year. And for the first time, we have one of our own full-time teachers um, in the classroom right now on the ballot, running 
for our public schools. So I want people to value education if they really take a look at the two candidates, do their homework on it, and figure out which one is going to support our public education, who is one of us. Like, teachers really need to pay attention. Uh, I heard the other segment, you know, a lot of disengaged voters, a lot of people don't go to the ballot, and I think this early voting might be a game changer for people because if you're a teacher, you'll say, oh, it's not one day off, I don't, you know, I don't want to go vote, I want to take my day off, but now you don't have an excuse. So we really want every voter out there to pay attention um, to what's going on with our schools. For far too long, we've been, you know, we have the corridor shame. We did a video years ago on that. We have um, infrastructure problems. We have schools without air conditioner. I get calls every August from a teacher who she's burning up in her classroom because there's no air. We, we saw during COVID, we have windows that don't open and close. They encouraged you to open windows. So that's been going on for far too long. The corridor of shame should not exist anymore. And it does. Um, we were gonna do a remake of it. I called the filmmaker and I said, what if we do a part two? He's like, you don't need to. We've only built two schools since we did part one. So wow. I think those are the kind of things that have been going on for far too long here because rural South Carolina, you know, there's this inequity in South Carolina education. The report card came out, you know, we were worried about this learning situation during COVID and we're right where we were, you know, pre-COVID as far as the report card goes, but that's not where we need to be. You know, the bottom 10 of 48, 47 isn't where South Carolina needs to be. We deserve better than that. There, um, and there are people that are running for election that I think would fix that. So we would be very excited to have um, a current teacher that um, is running in the race to be in the classroom because she's experiencing all the things that teachers are, are complaining about right now, the things that we need fixed. She sees firsthand over crowded classrooms. She knows what curriculum standards look like. She knows um, all of these things. So she's a very experienced candidate that's on the ballot for education. So. You know, I get mad when people play politics with their children because really we don't need to politicize all the things that both of your parties, uh, by the way, um, sometimes drag the children into it. And really we need to be doing what's best for children. And if we're doing what's best for children, we, sh we should be really worried about the schools without, all of us worried about the schools without air conditioning. You know, your fight is their fight. My fight is their fight. I taught, I've been fortunate to teach in two wealthy districts where I had air conditioning. But my concern is for those other places who do not. And those children deserve to go to a school that they're proud of that's not falling apart around them. Whether you're in Bamberg or Greenville, you know, your school system should be the same. So we've got to figure this out. It shouldn't be that hard to figure this out. We should look around to other states and figure out how do we get this funding mechanism in place where everybody is getting what they need to get a good education. So our children are suffering right now. Our education system is suffering because we are not putting children first in South Carolina. And so I'm really excited and hope that people will take a look at the candidates and look what they stand for, look what they voted on, look at their activities in the past. And it should be very clear to them, you know, which candidate for superintendent of education has public education at heart. <laughs> so, you know, I, I hope people take their time to do the research on that and look th that up and ask. I mean, we, we, ha we have a PAC process. We vet candidates. We invite both sides. I mean, we're a bipartisan organization. We invite Democrats and Republicans to sit down and talk with us and engage in our PAC process. Um, and we've talked to a lot of people during that. So we have our candidates posted. We have a list of our recommended candidates. So if people are interested in the, the vetted candidates through us, and what's very disheartening is sometimes some of the candidates won't even talk to us. You know, there's been no engagement um, with certain candidates with us at all. So that's disheartening because one of those folks is gonna win. And why not start building that relationship now? Why do you not feel the need to talk to the teachers oh, yeah. in this state? Yeah. Now, there were some things done by the legislature, pay raises, <laughs> things to try to address some of the issues that we've seen that were, no matter who's elected, the superintendent of education, they don't make the policies. Uh, they, can, they can encourage sure, <laughs> lawmakers sure. And, and leaders to make the policies. What needs to happen in those two chambers to address this issue from either of your estimation? I, like, I'll, I'll go first, and, and you know, I do give credit to the legislature. I think it was on the recommendation of Governor McMaster of the, the last round of teacher pay increases, um, you know, recommended, I think, school resource officers. I, t I think teachers have to feel safe, you know, when they're teaching. Um, we have, and this is something you alluded to, particularly with the corridor of shame, we have got to reform not just, you know, obviously more money is nice, but the fact is that for years we've been sending more money from the state 
to the corridor of shame in some of these rural schools than than go to these other districts. We've got, but you know, the, these local these districts in the poorest part of South Carolina are so heavily dependent on local tax base that simply is not there for the infrastructure that you're talking about. We have got to look at how we fund schools in, 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 in a, in a I, I hate the word holistic, but in, in that kind of manner, you know, in, in, in a you sound like of, a Democrat there, buddy. No, no, I mean, look, and, and again, this is not necessarily talking about more money, it's talking about spending the money that we have uh, better and, and like, let's, let's not let where you grow up and what zip code you're in determine how good your public education well, is. Well, I think one of the most significant, one of the worst pieces of legislation to ever come through South Carolina was Act 388. And that changed the entire revenue stream. We went from a stable revenue stream of paying for our education system to an extremely volatile revenue stream that could even impact public health policy. For example, one of the reasons Henry McMaster may very well have wanted to, to lift the mass mandate was because he needed the sales tax revenue in June from tourism to pay for the school system in South Carolina. If you'll, if you'll remember when we passed that bill, when the Republicans passed that bill, we lost the AAA credit rating because it's such a volatile revenue stream. I'm sorry, on th Act 388? Yeah. We lost the, the... When Mark Sanford was I governor. I know, but when we lost the AAA from who? From Moody's, believe. Fitch's, no, and Standard & Poor's. I don't think that's correct. It's a fact. I was okay. there. I was the deputy I was, state I was there treasurer. as well, and I don't think that's correct. I can correct, assure you we'll, it happened. We'll Google it at the break. Believe me, Rainey was in <laughs> <We> my <will. laughs> office. But the simple truth is this, is right now, my mother taught school for 48 years. And the greatest experiment of our democracy is the public education system. And the fact is, is we have a legislature that attempts every single time to divert tax dollars to private schools that discriminate on gender, race, sexuality, and potentially religion. We have a Republican candidate for the superintendent of education that will not have a master's degree by the time she is the election comes around. Bob Jones University created that degree and said they will award it to her in December. That's before she takes office, so she meets well, the requirements. Well, but, anyway. but, but no, right. the yeah. fact is this. She still did not act. The election. Again, you take no. this to court. No, she's, well, she's we're acting. going to. Go for it. But, yeah, I, would, but, I would love to see how this fact. turns out for the, you. Well, Good the, luck with all Joel, that. Joel, come on. <laughs> the Constitution and the law says you have to have a master's degree. She Lisa will Ellis she has two, office. and she's a public yeah, school teacher. But the fact is, is that the legal, the legal wording is going to determine whether it's the election or office. And I'm telling you right now that every single person listening to this show should call Bob Jones, go to their admission school, and ask for the same degree. Because this is what happens when Bob Jones, you call them, they give you Ellen Weaver's campaign number. And the fact is, it is a fraud being perpetrated upon the people of this state, and the accreditation of Bob Jones University should be at stake in this matter. And so you're, you're, mother, you're advocating my, harassing a private mother, institution because you well, don't like the so degree you're they saying offered. So you're saying that those folks, my mother worked 10 hours a day. You don't know how hard Ellen uh, Weaver's worked for her months, degree. Six yeah. months? I don't yeah, think four any months. teacher, four. four months, I don't think any teacher listening to this show got a master's degree in four months. Yeah, it, that it, is incredulous that you were sitting program. here saying this. Oh, it's a new program. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Joel didn't set it up. But Bob Jones But Bob Jones refuses to give anyone who calls access to the admissions policy. Instead, they send them to El I, 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 I appreciate that you're on this show like a uh, pro-harassing a private college. That's, that's So you're that's, saying that's they don't great, receive any federal funds? I, I'm saying that that's you're a great... You're saying they don't receive any federal funds? I'm saying funds? that they receive federal federal funds, for, but they are a private institution, Okay, Trav. so a private institution that receives federal funds. Oh, my goodness. Well, or harassing so a college. I mean, let's just, just say saying, harassing a college. Well, let's forget I'm public or private. I'm just saying that anybody you're, who wants you're a master's degree. pro-harassing educators who wants a when you don't like degree, the outcome. Anyone who wants a master's degree in four months instead of three years, call Bob Jones. They'll create the program for you. Well, before we go too far down the rabbit hole, there's one more thing. That, 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 we've already just gone down. Let's jump in here for just a second. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about, because both, all three have mentioned security. Security, feeling safe in the in, in yeah. school, uh, as a teacher. Your mother was a teacher for all those years. Right. Probably didn't face a lot of the things that current teachers right. face. You're in the classroom, have been for years. The world is different now. Yes. Um, we've seen it in recent weeks. Hoaxes and real things. It's frightening. It is. What 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 do you want to see? 
happen from anywhere? Do, you, do laws need to be stronger? Do, do, do the punishments need to be stronger if people think this is a good idea, whether they're 18 or 48? We, we absolutely are working with a coalition of people on a school safety plan and that we hope everyone, again, it, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. Yeah. We should all want our children to be safe. We should all want the best for what's going on in our schools. We do appreciate the SROs. We were part of that. We, we want um, the SROs in the schools. We've talked about that. We worked with um, our legislators on making sure we have funding for that, along with school nurses and mental health counselors. Right. So I think at this point now when we're seeing a lot of things, um, what I'm hearing from schools right now is they're seeing a lot of social emotional problems from children that are coming back, they're suicidal, they don't have enough mental health counselors. You're really asking teachers to do way too many things. You know, you're asking us to, to give out, you know, insulin was on the table. You know, we want you to get trained in how to, to give insulin. Yeah, they're which not the, nurses. The yeah. nurses were no. like, no, we don't want My the teachers given, was was <laughs> no. given insulin. So there's way too much going on, but school safety, the hoaxes last week were very scary. You know, for 21 of our were. schools, mm -hmm. that was very traumatic for our children. So we really need to, yeah, punish the folks that are doing these kind of things. And you mentioned earlier, I heard you say, you know, we have election workers that are being threatened. We also have teachers and mm -hmm. school employees that are assaulted verbally and physically. I got two calls this week about that. Absolutely has to stop. You know, we cannot keep teachers in the classroom when they're being harassed or verbally assaulted or physically assaulted by students and then sent to the office and give them some candy and say, don't do this again. <laughs> so we, we yeah. can't uh, continue those kinds of policies. We're gonna have to have a little more tough love on attendance, on truancy. You know, we were so worried before the pandemic from both sides and really the, from the Republicans the most mm -hmm. that we have truant children, we have hungry children, we have abused children. By God, open these schools and put these, you know, children in there. Well, where's the concern for all that now? You know, we still have truant children and abused children and hungry children and kids that can't read. But all we wanted to worry about during this legislative session was things that didn't really exist. We spent a lot of time fighting about vouchers. We spent a lot of time fighting about something called CRT, which most people didn't know what it was, even teachers. That took up the bulk of our time trying to give out information to, to people about these issues when we still have the hungry, abused, truant, illiterate children in our yeah. state. So we really need to get our priority state guys, uh, everybody, right. because we really, literacy should come first. We need a working class folks that can handle the new jobs that are coming in. So we really, really need to shift our focus off of what I'm gonna call party politics and using our children as pawns in this mess um, and really get down and dirty and get back to some good safe schools where our children can read and do math. And that's, you know, that, that's a little wish. It shouldn't, it, you know, it took us four years to get 30 minutes of bathroom break for a teacher. You know, four years, I was on your show yes, years you ago with, with my Hardy. bowl of toilet yep. paper showing that teachers can't go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And four years later, we got a 30 minute and we want to be proud. Oh, look what we've done for you. Okay, that should have never been an issue we had to even talk about. You know, so, and, and the pay raises, sure, it was great. Everybody's at 40,000, very misleading. Only That's seven, exactly right. only seven districts were below 40 to start with. So absolutely, they got a huge raise and thankful for all of that that our, our legislators did. But it's very misleading to say we've given every teacher this pay raise when a lot of districts, unless you were in those seven, you may have seen no pay raise. So, you know, we really need to ask the right questions and, and follow the dots and connect the dots of what is going on with our education system right now and follow it back a lot of the testing. It's all about money. You know, who's getting rich off of testing our children? And do your research, as you say. That's yes. right. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have to give you the last word. You've, you, you've, you've, she started the segment, she gets to end the segment. Thank you very much, Sherry East. It's a nice spirited debate here, but the bottom line, you said, do your homework before you go. Right. Pardon the pun. Do your homework. <laughs> before, do your homework. before you go, to, go the, to the ballot box. I will not pardon right. the pun. When we come back, we're gonna, you're not going to do okay. We're going to invite Jim Felder back to, to the, uh, the couch with us when we come back from the break. Welcome back to our town hall discussion on the midterm elections coming up in just a couple of weeks here. Your voice, your future, your vote. The critical part there, your vote. We've covered a lot in the last 50 minutes or so. But we, we, we could stay for hours and talk about what we need to talk about. We've talked about our local elections, our statewide elections. We've touched upon national elections. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. The votes that are made here in these congressional races where our voices as South Carolinians are brought back to Washington to talk about this pocketbook 
issues, to talk about the social issues, to talk about so many different elements of, of this. It's, th this election season feels different to me in a lot of different ways. In some ways, I don't feel it's as heated. In other ways, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, in your estimation, how do our voters feel? What, what, what do you feel from phone calls, from things of that nature? I think there's a lot of confusion. I mean, yeah. and I think that that is just simply because of the point of where we are historically speaking. It's easier to confuse and muddy the water as opposed to find out the truth. Or, you know, it used to be a time that we would all um, agree on certain facts, on certain truths, and in certain institutions that were the bedrock of our social contract. Democracy was the way we changed the social contract or how we changed those institutions. And the contention was, or, or the argument was not in in those institutions, but the method or, or sometimes the, the minute changes. We now seem to be living in a world in which people just don't believe the truth. They don't believe a set series of facts and they may not believe in the foundation or the, the, the institutions that make up that bedrock. And so it creates a very, very confusing electorate. It can, I think that there is a segment of our electorate and, and you all can tell me if I'm right or wrong, that can no longer be polled or can no longer be communicated. I think there is a silent majority. At least majority. effectively. That's right. Well, That's right. It is, it is beyond elections. It's, it's, it's in every area of, of society, you know, education, medicine, right. industry, you go down the list where, you know, we have these powerful devices in the palm of our hands that have access to all the world's information. And it's somehow... Right and wrong information. That's right. Well, That's it's, exactly right. it's somehow managed yeah. to make us dumber and meaner. Uh, and because people can find the facts that they want, the facts that they That's want right. to believe rather than necessarily you know going down to that third or fourth uh, search and figuring out what is yep. what is true um, I, I think that you know there's almost you know an, an over abundance of information in some cases combined with you know confirmation bias seeking out information that you want to believe before you even go into the research and and that's that's done some things to society that I I, I don't think we really well, understand I the think full it's effect extremely of that. important to show that our temperament here is we can fight till the death on sure, various yeah. ideas, but at the end of the day still sit here and, Absolutely. and talk to each other. And I think that that's something that coming out of COVID, um, I don't know if Sherry's experiencing this in the, the education community, I don't know mm -hmm. if you're experiencing it, but people don't have the same amount of patience and there's a lot more anger. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's necessarily gauged at a political world. They may bear the brunt of it, mm -hmm. but it's something that's changed in the psyche of people, and that's unfortunate. And I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, we have become so polarized right. that yeah. party members, obviously party members, almost can't speak to each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a real problem. It is. My day in the legislature, we didn't have many Republicans at that time back <laughs> in the 70s. The good old days. <laughs> the good old days. But after battling it out in General Assembly, Democrats and Republicans could go to the Capital City Club, right. or right. the Capital City Restaurant, for the one, and, and sing songs together. Right. You know. mm -hmm. But we don't have that now. We, right. we don't have the patience now. That's the other part of it. So our children look at us, right, and they imitate us in other kind of ways. So you have all this kind of crap going on in schools now about the hoaxes and all of that because they see and it's dangerous the right. exactly. and frightening. It, it is yeah. frightening. So we got to deal with that because children they, they watch what they, we do. Right. Same thing about voting. You need if you don't vote, your child is probably not going to vote because they haven't seen you go to the polls. They haven't seen you talk politics in the house. So what are they supposed to do? They get on cell phones and go to right. TikTok and all right. that and just cut politics out completely. And, and what, what no one get? could yes. see was he was on his cell phone during the break. I just want to point that out. <laughs> not me and you. I was, not the three of us. taking calls from <laughs> concerned voters that had questions <laughs> about the upcoming election. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he did. But, you, but you, you do get the call. You always do. You get calls with que from people who have yes. so many yes. questions yes. about this. Do you feel some of the things that they were talking about? Confusion from people still. It is. People yeah. are confused. They are confused. And when they see the way adults act, you know, it's more confusing. It, they turn you off and they go to something else. That's right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about Sherry mentioned uh, public education. I gotta gotta remind you where public education began in this state. It was the Reconstruction re, right. re, Reconstruction legislature, mm -hmm. legis legislature where you had a predominantly black presence there that brought public education into the, the into the mix. So I just wanted to. 
but but remind us about history a little bit. But there is an assault on public education right yeah. now, and the truth is, is that there needs to be an evaluation of Act 388. It was it was a horrible piece of legislation that that completely made all of our coastal counties donor counties mm -hmm. to other school districts. Well, not just, not just coastal counties either, but Spartanburg, well, Greenville, right. Racial right. Lexington that's 5. Right. I mean, that, you're, yeah. That's fair. Yeah. You're right. And But I do believe that, that the simple truth is, is you ha when you fund our education system and where it should be, you pay teachers above the national average, and you take care of them as you would an employee of a private company, and, and you make sure that they're doing what they need, they have the resources, our education system will change. If you don't have an educated child, you're not going to have an educated workforce and you're not gonna be able to bring those jobs that Henry keeps saying are coming. <laughs> Speaking of workforce, I'm sure you gave him credit for Paying for a technical education for the for the school with the with the uh, COVID. No, that was Fritz Holling that was that started. No, the no, 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 no. I'm talking about right right now technical school being free because of Henry McMaster and the workforce. Well, I think that's Henry trying to have it both ways. He criticizes Joe Biden for any hey, hey, program. If, you, if the money's going to come, put it, it to good it, use. It put it to good use. Well, I yeah. mean, if he did it within the confines of the law and what the money was prescribed or or. or the purpose of that money, I don't have a problem with it. But when you take COVID money and tax dollars to send to your personal private parochial school, I've got a problem with I that. I understand that. Yeah, we I could mean, have a whole just, show that's on right. school that's exactly right. We could yeah. do another hour on it. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've done about 20 <laughs> years on it. <laughs> but how and how we tried to buy off all of that. But I'm, I, I must say that South Carolina really has grown from an economic standpoint. You know, we, Without we, a doubt. We, we, are the state, we are a state now that we manufacture cars and we're the cap right. higher capital of the world now and all of that. Uh, so we should. And that's based on the foundation that Democrats laid in the General Assembly. <laughs> and, and Bill Clinton, who shrunk the national it's a, deficit it's by a good one. Good thing we only got one minute left. Right, I don't know yeah. how much air you have left. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, I, let, I had Trav lead off, so you get to close it out. Yeah. No, I, we have one now, I do appreciate Al Gore inventing the internet as, as well. But how we find all that no, information? Look, I mean, just, yeah. just vote. I mean, this this would yeah. always say, you know, yeah. regardless of who you vote for, regardless of what issues are most important to you, please just show up. Please vote. Politicians will not take you seriously if you That's don't. Right. Correct. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, the, the, the final thing I wanted to say is, if you don't like the candidates who are on the ballot, you can write in. That's right. right. You can That's write in your well. favorite yeah. candidate. You don't have to vote for who's on there. All right. Some oh. people write in Donald Duck. Some write in Mickey Mouse. But you can write in a candidate if you're not satisfied with who's on the ballot. You All can right. do Punch, that in a general election. Democratic Party ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could also do that if you want. <laughs> and, and shameless plug, he's got a book that'll be coming out on the late Senator McKinley Washington. Senator McKinley Washington will be out uh, December 1st. McKinley Washington book will be out. The Life and Times of McKinley Washington. From the farm to the state house. Senator from Charleston. Yeah, all right. I'm glad you got that in. See, we could have given that more air time right there. Always good to, to have all of you uh, gentlemen in here and, of course, Sherry East. Too. We haven't had this opportunity. We talked right. about COVID. We talked about mm -hmm. the pandemic. We haven't had a chance to get everybody in this studio together and actually hash things out. We've all been in Zoom yeah. windows we have. Right. and, yeah. and yeah. Skype windows, yeah. and it's good to have everyone back in here. But thank you again, Joel Sawyer, <laughs> Trav Robertson, Jim Felder, and also Sherry East. And remember, voting for us the 24th. That's right. this coming That's right. week, Monday. November 8th, yeah. of course. Is. But thank you for watching us on air and, of course, online as well on our website. We've been streaming there, and if, if you're still watching us there, we have you covered there 24 hours a day, whether it's politics, whether it's education, whether it's things that are happening just down the street from you. You can get uh, everything you need 24 hours a day at WACH.com. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this town hall. Your voice, your future, your vote.